Good. Brilliant. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. It's lovely to be at Brocktoberfest again and live as well, which is still feels novel given uh, recent events. I want to start off with a confession that some of you might feel is horrific given that we're at Brocktoberfest. I have a love-hate relationship with Brocks. Now, that might sound perverse given what it is that we've been excavating for a third of my career, perhaps. But I mean this in a particular way. It's more the concepts that have surrounded and engulfed Brock studies that I find sometimes a bit dry. And so today what I want to do is say, as the title suggests, what have we learned so far? But I want to cover a few things that are quite generic, just as an introduction, just things that will inevitably almost come out of the excavation and post-excavation studies that were undertaken. They're very normal, very conventional things, but I actually want to spend far more time discussing things that I personally find far more interesting, engaging and fascinating in terms of some of the themes that I'm really hopeful to develop in research terms beyond the excavation itself, and which I think are emanating and coming through from the, the fieldwork itself. going yeah there we go so the boring stuff in a way the background just to set the scene 15 seasons of excavation have now been undertaken at the cairns we've uncovered large parts of the remains of 22 iron age buildings which again makes a point it's not all about brocks there's an awful lot more to the iron age even at brock sites in the northern isles there's far more to the iron age than the brocks themselves the brocks are just a, a fulcrum a center point Yes, they're major, yes, they're monumental, yes, they're substantial and important, but they are one context of these sites. Thousands of artifacts, tens of thousands of hand-recovered animal bones and thousands of environmental samples. And the, the good thing is that we've been processing a lot of this material as we go. And that's been an opportunity for us already to be able to make certain statements about things. So these are the kinds of things, the kind of standard themes that I mentioned at the beginning. And even within these, there are quite non-standard and quite unconventional ways of looking at these, but certainly our project, like any substantial, very big excavation, will inevitably make contributions to these sorts of things. So in terms of artifact sequences, for instance, huge amounts of artifacts will inevitably allow us to plug into previous syntheses and understandings of artifacts and to contribute to them, and also to build sequences, for instance, for the pottery and be able to say, well, where does this style of pottery fit in in the sequences? So much, so far, so good. These are the standard sort of, sorts of things. Also, our site at the Cairns is very, very well preserved in terms of faunal remains. So animals will also feature significantly. In fact, I think probably there's more animal bone from the site than any other category of find in that yeah. sense. There's huge amounts of animal bone and the perfect preservation conditions just make it so suitable, so eminently suitable for the preservation of it. So again, we will inevitably be saying a lot about subsistence, about economy, about diet, but probably more interestingly, things like food culture and the use of animals. And I want to talk about the use of animals in very expressive ways that people have been engaging in at the site as well. But certainly it's human animal relationships in the broadest sense will inevitably feature significantly. And here's just a, an array of finds, pottery, metal objects and pins and rings and beautiful glass toggle bead and here's some ebgs associated bone groups which we'll go into a bit more detail shortly and also in the in the time that we've spent at the cairns we've also been able to do an awful lot of work in the broader landscape we never wanted that site to be just yet another route one investigation of a point a nodal point in the landscape we always wanted to use the site as a way of investigating people's relationships to that landscape through time, and both during the Iron Age, before the Iron Age, and well after the Iron Age for that matter. Here's just some of those animal remains, vast quantities of it on a day-to-day -day basis. At any point in the excavation, you could expect to see all sorts of huge amounts of animal bone recovered. Lots of micro animal bone and lots of other categories of material being recovered from the samples and the processing of those samples. The artifactual material 
uh, some of it very standard and normal, but the quantities and the ability to peer into these objects right, en masse and in context and in stratigraphy and through phasing is obviously an important part of the, the site um, contribution that it can make to the ongoing synthesis of the Iron Age. An array of glass beads, for instance, beautiful objects in themselves, exotic imports, we believe. And the landscape dimension, here's some geophysical survey. So here's the cairns down in southeast South Ronaldty near the Bay of Winnick, which handily Sarah introduced for us earlier on as a site. It's an enclosed ditch enclosure settlement <clears throat> to the north of it, Neolithic settlement to the southeast, uh, what we think is a Bronze Age settlement. We've geophysically surveyed these things and test pitted them and discovered these in the part and parcel during the part parcel of the excavation project itself. Down here, closer to the shore itself, at, at Winnick itself, another early Iron Age settlement dating to about 600 BC with a souterrain and underground structure, a bit like the structure A that Rick was talking about and an above ground building. And so what we're looking at is very interesting, actually, is, is a really interesting aspect, is that through time, we're actually able to perceive the trajectory of communities over thousands of years, wobbling around this landscape and taking up new positions within it. And then that allows us to say, well, why are we doing that exactly? So sometime in the late fourth millennium BC, that we've got that late Neolithic settlement and about maybe 2000, 2300 BC, something like that. They move down the hill, move down the slope to the Bronze Age settlement and its enhanced field systems. Perhaps they still occupy that place in the early Iron Age, but certainly there's a smaller scale early Iron Age settlement closer to the bay. And then by the middle Iron Age, they come all the way back up again to the Cairns to just 20 metres to the south of that Neolithic settlement. So what's this wandering around this landscape all about? It's really fascinating. And we can ask all sorts of questions about it. I'm not going to provide huge amounts of answers today for that, but I will indicate that that is something that we'll, we'll look into and think about in terms of that dynamic over thousands of years. One thing I would say, though, is that now that we have good ancient DNA evidence for both the population present in the Iron Age at the Cairns. And now that we know that there is a major change in the population of large parts of Britain in that early Bronze Age, it does, have, it does make us think if whether or not this change from the late Neolithic to the early Bronze Age is to some extent inflected with this big, this big population change which I'll not go into in huge detail, but is fascinating nevertheless, what used to be called the Beaker period my previous generation. So here's the, here's the, we've gone from the landscape to zoom back in on the site itself, and here's the Brock at the Cairns, and just to indicate how much of a, a nice kind of radiocarbon dating saturation that we've given to the Brock. There's actually even more radiocarbon dates for the Brock itself than is indicated here now, but nevertheless, it gives us a good basis, and it's allowing us to bracket our Brock and probably allowing us to say that it's quite a late Brock we're probably talking about the late first century BC, maybe even into the early first century AD, that the Brock is founded and constructed. And it is a weird Brock in various ways, which is, again, as we said earlier on, weird is good. So, you know, maybe we'll, we'll explore that idea in a, in a bit for sure. Here are, the, here are the things I want to talk about. Here are the things that the, the themes that I wanted to actually um, discuss a little bit more detail. So, there's four of them here. <clears throat> um, the lifestyles, the lives of people actually inhabiting that brock, that's something that I find particularly interesting. I want to think about the aftermath of brocks. I want to explore this idea of architecture, agency, and choice. We've heard about agency already. And finally, depositional practice. So these are four things, and they're not exclusive. They're not exhaustive. There will be other themes that we will explore, but there are things that I thought at this point in time, we're actually, start, we're actually starting to think in more detail about these and we can, we can start developing some of these. So first of all, Brock life. And what would Brocktoberfest be if we were to peer into some Brock life? It's a bit like park life. And there we go. So here's, here's, here's the, the West Room of the Brock. 
So we'll think about that because we've done a lot of work in that west room in previous seasons of excavation, probably more intensive amounts of excavation within this west room than most of the other areas at this stage. And it's a particularly full on area in terms of the busyness of it, the, the, the amount of detail that we've procured from the excavations and the volume of information, the volume of material that's come out of that west room of the Broch um, during the excavations. And that's where it is, as its name suggests, that you literally named the west room as a central half. Paved areas partially and dark charcoal area floors, which are effectively not much more, we think, than the, than the rake out from the heart, tamped down perhaps, maybe not even very formally so. And I'm not going to elaborate in huge amounts of detail. But one of the things that's really interesting about this, and one of the things that marks it out from a lot of previous Brock excavations, you know, we've had 150 years of Brock excavations now, and there's been a lot of work and a lot of thought, but actually there haven't been an awful lot of excavations. There's only a handful of excavations that have been excavated, the sites rather, that have been excavated in the modern era. And most of those haven't actually got to the original floor horizons. So it's actually really relatively unusual. When people say, why dig another brock? My answer is usually because we haven't dug enough of them. And that isn't a panacea. Normally I would say the panacea for all ills in archaeology is not to dig more of X. But in this particular case, I think it probably is. Bizarrely, we do need to dig more brock. But financially, administratively, politically, that's problematic because they're perceived as difficult, expensive, intransigent. So there haven't actually been an awful lot of excavations of brochs in recent years. And as I say, those that have have hardly been, have often not been exhaustive. And those brochs that have been excavated, they've often, they've often been described and narratized as single period activity, single period occupation. So whilst there are some commentators like Neil Sharples who evoke the idea of Brock being lived in for hundreds of years and being powerful symbols in the landscape for long periods of time, generation after generation. On the other hand, much of the excavated evidence or rather reportage has insisted that Brock's, when they're encountered in excavation terms, are all just a single period, a little bit of you know, change here and there, a bit of organic change and transformation there, but not multiple sequences. The cairns is different. The cairns certainly does show sequences of floors over time. And we've been able to call these cycles, and this is just for the West Room. That cycle one, as we understand it at the moment, the pink is a central half, and you have paved area up to the northwest, <laughs> and you have kind of radial partitions formed through um, uprights, which almost define little bays, little sub areas within the West Room itself. And through time, it changes. So the, the hearth loses its identity. The paving gets covered over by more rake out from the hearth. This is busy life witness. So this is the second part of the, of the cycle one. So like this, the starting point is formally laying it out and then it's lived in and used and it gets covered up and it get, the material gets spilled all over the place, which is lovely for us because it's full of good interest and information, both environmentally and artifactually in terms of what's going on in there. Then there's a pause, there's a renewal, there's a new floor, a new stone floor laid. So this is where we identify cycle two within the structure and a new hearth. The hearth is placed in the same place. The uprights still define those bays. There's still a heavily paved area, particularly over on the Northwest. So there's, there's recursive repetition. There's a desire to maintain and to stabilize the way of life right down to the sort of specific physical realities of that room within the Brock. And so uh, we can certainly see this continuity even in the midst of this transformation, but it's, it's renewal, it's, it's new floors. Often, interestingly, what we find trapped in and under these new slab floors are deposits like little shell groups or little groups of animal bone, little, I, I would argue, probably little votives, very deliberate deposits that have been placed probably is foundational material, little querns and quern rubbers and things like that. So stone tools involved in this also. And there may well have been many organic items that are lost to us now 
and are just simply not uh, preserved. So that's cycle two. It also has subsequent life use. And then cycle three, they go again, they start again. So a new hearth slab laid out in the same place and a new paved area up to that northwest area, a new slightly larger slabs. And it's repeated again. So this recurrent repetitive reuse. And this is happening from a radiocarbon date. This is happening over a period of maybe 200 years so far from our dates. So this is long-term memory. You might just say, well, they're, they're just mindlessly repeating the layout and the features of the room. But I don't think there's anything mindless about the points in time where they choose to actually renew uh, the layouts. And then late cycle three, uh, it's almost that hearth is almost suffocated with our ashy material. And then eventually <clears throat> we're in towards the end of the cycles within that west room. So it's a relatively simple sequence, although there's an awful lot more detail wrapped up in that than I you know, wanted to summarize for our purposes today. But nevertheless, what we see is for once, nice depth, nice retigraphy, nice phasing, what we call our cycles. And that means that we are looking at, we're peering into the either intentionality or otherwise of people reproducing their circumstances, reproducing domestic life, and presumably also the relationships that go with that. The, the groups of people, the household that lived there and how they interacted with the space, how they used it and how they interacted with each other is replicated also over that 200 year period of time, not an insignificant amount of time in that period. And what sort of things do we find in that West Room? What are they actually doing over time? Well, huge amounts of scoffing is what they're doing. Scoffing massive amounts of food, red deer, lots of red meat in particular. Again, we're really lucky. A lot of rock excavations don't yield in situ animal bone in those floor deposits at all, uh, or fairly rarely. And here we've got huge quantities of, of animal bone, which is obviously very helpful to us. And also the treatment of that animal bone. And again, patterns within it as well that we can observe. So red deer, lots of the, the base of the, the feet, uh, the legs, metacarpals, metatarsals, et cetera. And lots of it broken and scorched and probably marrow extracted in particular sorts of ways. So we can see a kind of repetitive food practices underway. And red deer is a dominant theme for all these generations of people who are inhabiting this broth in this west room. Red deer, red deer, red deer. Now the normal hierarchy of animal bone species and the normal hierarchy that we see so far from the village surrounding the broth is cattle, sheep, pig, then maybe some red deer, other animal species like fish and lots of shellfish sometimes and various other types of species. But this is turning that on its head in the brock itself. The, the dominant animal species are red deer, then yes, maybe cattle, and then things like seal and whale and lots of shellfish um, and, uh, and fish itself. So it's quite an unusual, quite an odd hierarchy of species. And again, that leads us into discussions like, is this special diet? Relating to the status of the Brock inhabitants, or is a special diet relating to feasting within that Brock that more of the community come in to undertake and are part of? And this gets straight to the heart of one of the most important questions about Brocks. And after 150 years of studying Brocks, we still cannot effectively answer, which is the age old question of okay, a Brock is a house if we believe modern archaeology, but it's a special house, it's a monumental house. Who's living there? Is it high status? Is it equivalent of the landed gentry of that era? Or is, it, or is there something more subtle going on in terms of social differentiation and hierarchy? So we have the opportunity to peer into those things inherent in the animal bone. Here's some more red deer, scorched, blackened from being directly in the fire. So bits of bone, joints of meat that have been broken up and partially scorched where the meat was thinner over the bone. Lots of burnt bone, lots of smithereens of burnt bone across those house floors, which again, we've been able to track uh, in fine detail across, because of our sample strategy, we've finely detailed this burnt bone across the floor. And you can see concentrations of it in key areas. There's animal bone, burnt bone and burnt stones. There's a big pit in the southern end of the western room and it has fire crack stones associated with it. And it looks like they're boiling up that water using heat affected stones and immersing joints of deer meat and other 
meat into that and then cooking it and bringing it out and consuming it. <clears throat> so Westrum is pretty cool and has lots going for it and it gives us insights into broch lives. And we also have broch lives. We also have the lives of a household. And again, that's really unusual to have these fragments and it's fragmentary and tiny and and lost souls as they are, fragments of people, it's still phenomenally useful and interesting to have these and be able to recover these from a Brock settlement, from a Brock and from the Brock period settlement itself. And they manifest themselves in ways, well, that Rick alluded to in terms of fragmentary and disarticulated human remains. So probably our, our, our largest portion of a person is this jawbone, this mandible, so called the so-called elder, as she is nicknamed. Uh, but also various teeth molars, very handily, because we can get we can extract ancient DNA from those, and we have. Um, and even uh, some of you will know, but would you believe uh, even preserved human hair fibers that we've recovered from anaerobic conditions in subterranean structures, the so-called well underneath the floor of the broch in the north rim of the broch. So these again probably cannot give us. DNA information because waterlogged anaerobic preservation kills the DNA signature, but it can give us isotopic signature, which is almost as interesting, if not more interesting in some ways than the DNA, because it tells us about food, tells us tells us about um, food along the hair shaft consumed over a incrementally over a period of say 12 months, which are most of these hair fibers are 11 to 12 centimeters, so they recover incremental dietary information over that period of time. And as I say, they're, they're present across parts of the house. So it's rarer than hen's teeth to be able to get fragments of people that we think very firmly relate to the Brock household itself. That's an enviable opportunity to explore those. And we've We've already received some really interesting ancient DNA and isotopic information, only, su only some of which I can share. But for instance, our elderly lady, she's in her 50s plus, plus, plus. And of course, that's a relative measurement of elderliness, he said, being himself in that category, um, relatively elderly for the Iron Age. And she always, we were always aware she had a, a highly rich marine diet um, from the isotopes. But because she had so few teeth in her jaw, it was often suggested, well, is this just because she's eating a large amount of marine protein because it's soft food that she can eat? But the recent work that was undertaken by the Comios project based in Bradford University that we're collaborating with uh, to look at this, so people like Ian Armit and Maddie Bleasdale, has allowed us to peer into her isotopes across her lifespan at incremental data points. So when she was three years old and five years old and seven years old and nine and at 12 years old and at 15 years old and then when she was an elderly woman. So that showed that the marine protein was high throughout her life and from her infancy in, into her age as a young adult. So it's nothing to do with her teeth. It's something to do with her. And to contextualize that, the point is that marine protein doesn't show up very regularly in middle Iron Age people at all across large parts of Scotland. In fact, large parts of Britain don't seem to be absorbing much in the way of marine protein. And yet here's this person with a very high marine signature right from the beginning of her life. It's nothing to do with convenience, expediency and manageability. It's to do with something inherent in her character as a person. And that's going to be really interesting to follow up with the other isotopes from the other members of the household team, as it were, whose fragments we have. Um, I also want to talk about a little bit about Brock layouts, because I mentioned that the Cairns Brock is weird. And this is kind of more standard stuff. This is more, more what we tend to expect. So on the left, the interior of the very substantial stone roundhouse at Boo. And on the right, the phase five, sorry, phase six um, Brock tower at the How. And both of these uh, perfectly well illustrate the kind of standard layouts that we've kind of expect for big roundhouses and for brocks. And actually we saw something similar in some of the Swartigill buildings. Big central hearth, relatively open concentric space, and then sometimes radial partitions around 
the edges that form kind of bays or separated areas, discrete areas that may have acted for different kinds of activities. So these are the kind of standard layouts. The Brockett Ferns doesn't look like that at all. It's very different. It's far more internally subdivided. There's far more offer stats arranged around a kind of um, uh, more than quadrilateral, but I'm not sure how to describe that, but there are five major rooms that are subdivided and there are internal corridor spaces that maintain the logic of the space. It's very coherent, it's very intelligible because it's very well preserved, but it is odd, it's an odd layout. And it reminds us to some extent of the kind of, um, what are often referred to as medial walls that run across the interiors of later Brock uh, structures. I'm thinking, for instance, uh, Midhow and Rousey, where there's a, a major wall that runs right across the interior of the Brock. Uh, and uh, other roundhouses, one of the wheelhouse structures at Old Scatness in Shetland also has a wall that just runs right across the middle, middle of the interior of the space. Quite odd. And they're often written off as late manifestations. One archaeologist has talked about them as being what happens when the household is outgrowing itself. And there's kind of quarrelling and wrangling over inheritance, and maybe they set up this different internal division to reflect a kind of splitting off of the inheritance and the lineage of the house. I'm not convinced by that. And one of the things that the Cairns that is becoming increasingly evident is this is the way out of the interior of the Brock at the Cairns from the outset. It's not some ad hoc response to changes within the structure of the household. This is the way this Brock was built from the outset. So that doesn't really go with the explanation of through time, you know, the household is, is expanding and, and leading to complexity in terms of inheritance. And as I say, it's very well laid out, it's very well preserved and very, very easy to see how people would have accessed the interior space. And that's what we're showing here, which is grand. But what's also evident here is there's a bifurcation in that layout. So there's a suite of apartments on the west, north, and northeast side, indicated here with a kind of purpley blue uh, arrows, and then a suite of apartments in the red on the south and southeast side of things, and then a coaxial corridor space that runs from the inner entrance, uh, sorry, from the entrance passage and along that corridor, and it splits, it forks either side. Those two suites of rooms are mutually exclusive. They communicate within those suites, but they do not relate to each other. And that looks like a major structuring of that household. And it reminds us again, it reminds me anyway, of that kind of more simple manifestation of this that I've already discussed, what we find at sites like Old Scatness and Midhow, where it's split in two. In this particular instance, it looks like this is how it was laid out from the outset. I think it has repercussions for understanding the identity and the composition of households. I think this probably relates to quite tight subdivision of groups of people who live in here. It might be gender. There's lots of anthropological uh, parallels for that kind of gendered structure of the household. Men and women largely separated out within a space. That would lead some archaeologists sometimes to talk about sequestration of women and the set side of women, but that's kind of quite a medieval kind of concept of, of the house and of gender subdivision. Doesn't necessarily follow that in later prehistory that's going to happen. And in actual fact, if we were to somehow conjecture and speculate that the southern and southeast suite of rooms was the feminine side of this gender divide, then they would have access, the only access that we know of to the staircase, and therefore to the whole of the upper upper elements of the of the brock, including probably storage and, and status that goes with the, the height of the building. So I think we probably, and I won't go into it in any detail today, and I have mentioned it before, I think we probably could explore gender identities at work, but not, not perhaps in the ways that we normally think of them, um, in, in some non-Western societies, but actually in, in ways in which uh, the balance of power within gender relations was somewhat different to today uh, in our recent history. Right, another theme I wanted to talk about, depositional practice. So this one, this one always gets close to ritual, and ritual always gets a bad rep when archaeologists talk about ritual. So, you know, we, rightly, people laugh, Archaeologists overuse of the word ritual. 
but it's only because we've used it in such a poor set of ways in the previous in the past, you know, in that kind of way of sweeping it into the dustbin. Uh, we don't understand this, so let's stick it in the ritual mode. And then if we put it in the ritual dustbin, then we can forget about it and it doesn't have to trouble us anymore. Well, there are aspects of deposition that border on those concepts of ritual. But what I'm getting at is the broader spectrum, the entire spectrum of deposits that form the basis of much of what we call the archaeological record. So yeah, there's special deposits, however we define them. There's these, as I mentioned already, associated bone groups. And on the right-hand side there, there's a little lamekin, which is one of those special bone deposits we found this year. There are groups of artifacts that are deposited in particular ways with what seems to be aesthetic and expressive intent. That's the point. And that's the true, the truly interesting aspects of deposition is when we're peering into what, why people are curating, is a good word that we heard Rick use already, why people are curating objects in particular ways with particular effects in particular places at particular times. And, and this is part of this business of, of depositional practice when it's expressive and aesthetic, has aesthetics to it. And that's when we're getting an insight into, or we can potentially get an insight into what's going on between these people in terms of their relations with the world. And then, and then what I want to talk about are architectural installations. They're the installation of objects which were previously free to roam, objects that had lives, that had uses, that were used as stone tools, that were used as pots, that were used as in all sorts of ways and had trajectories and pathways that flowed through people's lives. And then they're seized, they're recruited into architecture, they're built in, they're installed into architecture, they become inalienable, whereas before they were alienable. They become inalienable and they become fixed. And things like stone tools and hearths, querns and paving and roofs of buildings, all sorts of objects that are captured and placed in particular contexts, which then have sometimes generations of visibility within the setting of a particular piece of architecture within the, a, a house. Deposition at the end of the Bross, a good example of this massive amount of deposition towards the end of the Brock, around about AD 200, vast quantities of material brought to that Brock just as they're ending it. They're reducing the height of the Brock, they fill it in with rubble, but in the process of filling it in and before they begin that process of infill, they're laying out associated bone groups of animals. Think of these as joints of meat, effectively, most of these are. So they're probably remnants of feasting. In some cases, they're probably the portion of feasted produce that hasn't been consumed by living people. In this case, it's been left on floors and in particular places, not for the living, I would humbly submit, but for the ancestors, the people whose broch they are now abandoning at this particular context. There are stone tools. There's our famous deposit outside the, the front door of the broch. That is the, the whalebone vessel and the jawbone of the elder that we saw already. And it's two antlers and it's two lambs and all sorts of things deposited there. And our deposit of combs. And, uh, in its potty just outside the brock at the same time. Vast quantity, highly methodical, incredibly intensive, but exactly the kind of concentration you'd expect for the generation who are finally ending a brock that's been up and running for maybe 200, 250, 300 years, has been the dominant, powerful symbol within that landscape of everything that the moral, political authority in that landscape. And you're the generation that's going to end it. Imagine that. Imagine how careful you'd be in the process of ending that major building with all of its history, all of its ancestry, all of its series of events that are known about through social memory. Of course, you're going to take elaborate measures to do that. And here's that elder deposit, carefully curated in a modern context for us, with the human jawbone and the big whalebone vessel and the, the red deer antlers. And in the afterbroch period, in the aftermath of the broch, the site goes on. It goes on for hundreds of years. And we were talking about Swartigill and about its long-lived history beyond the Middle Iron Age, beyond the, the concrete basis of those 
those houses in the early and middle Iron Age into a period that becomes fuzzier, actually, to see, more difficult to, to, to make out the clarity of things to some extent. Buildings change, building forms change, and at the Cairns, this is just one example of the kind of thing that's really interesting for us to, to look at. That, that's a kind of basic summary of some of the post-rock buildings that are found on site. A whole number of bites taken out of the, the brock. The brock is like a hackneyed old metaphor that I use, but the brock is like a, a big apple with bites taken out around the side of it, into which have been inserted all sorts of later Iron Age, sometimes Pictish, buildings and wags not wives and girlfriends of footballers but wags uh Caithness name probably derived from uh a, a scottification of the gallic vav for cave uh indicating their semi-sunken nature these buildings are far more understood far better sorry they're far more common in Caithness. they're not very well understood at all and the Cairns gives us an opportunity to peer into them because we've been able to recover huge amounts of material, huge amounts of data from the environmental signature, from the architectural side of things, from the artifactual material from the site. And it's into this period, about AD 300, that that second flourish of metalwork and that Sarah pointed out in her talk earlier on actually pertains. So monumental brocks, huge big monumental houses end. They end about AD 200. Some of them are, are lived in for longer than that, but nobody's building them beyond that period. And nobody really knows why that is. And there's often questions around, why do the brocks end? Why do they end then as well? And what we have the opportunity to do at the Cairns is actually to reflect on that. So this is our so-called structure B complex. It's a series of interconnecting buildings. There's at least three. There may, be, there may be more beyond the trench edge itself. Our principal, most substantially excavated one, structure B1, sub-rectangular building. We know from the dates that it's earlier than previously thought in most literatures. So these are normally positioned in the 5th or 6th centuries AD by commentators. But actually, there's very few of them in, excavated in, in, in the homeland of Wags in Caithness itself. Very few excavated. And in Orkney, we've had one excavated effectively at the Howe in the 70s and early 80s. And the dates for it came from sandwiches of material from above the building and below the building, so less precise than we would like. At the Cairns, we've been able to smother it in radiocarbon dates and other parts of the same phase on site as well. And we know that it dates as early as AD 300. And the reason that's important is, whoops, is because that then takes us into a different cultural context. Because first of all, what we're looking at is no simple, slow evolution from big monumental round architecture to ultimately rectangular buildings through subcellular buildings, multicellular buildings, and figure of eights on the way, sort of smooth, gradual evolution. We're looking at really dramatic change from these big circular buildings to these rectangular buildings. There's something dramatic going on there. And you can bet your bottom dollar it's important because when you have such rapid and dramatic change, in the domestic relations between people as expressed in their houses, then that's really probably very significant. And at the Cairns, that AD 300 dating, redating of WAGs is, is meaning that it's the tail end of the Middle Iron Age, which is just a sort of conventional archaeologist's arbitrary phasing. So, so what? But what actually is probably more important in that, I would argue, is that means we're not dealing with the, the post-Roman period as previously thought, that change is happening in the late Roman period. The Romans are still kicking about south of Orkney at this point in time. They are episodically making forays. They're involved in diplomatic activities. They're involved in bribery, bribery and corruption. They are exploitative, manipulative. They are doing what empires do in that period through, AD, through the, the fourth century AD. And it's at that point in time that these buildings change dramatically. And so whilst it's long since been the case that, that the idea that brochs were somehow towers of defence against Roman slave raiders, and long since has that idea been poo-pooed and rightly so, at the end of the brochs, I think it's far more likely that local communities and ideologies are undermined by 400 years of the Roman Empire being in proximity to them. 
and it has big changes on domestic and architectural uh, forms. Anyway, so our, uh, a brief example of architecture, agency and choice, that theme that I wanted to highlight, just using a single example. It's often, and this is where it comes back to these original ideas that I mentioned at the start of the talk, I sometimes get a bit, <clears throat> I'm a bit ambivalent sometimes about some of the ways in which Baroque's are narrated and discussed. And one of those is about this kind of evolutionary architecture that's often um, evoked. And so you often get a kind of suite of a, almost a list, a checklist of features that relate to a true Brock and what a true Brock has to possess in order to earn its status in the terminology and in the, in the, uh, the technical terminology. Um, and one of those are things like guard cells and things like rebated entrances. Now, a rebated entrance is a quite a complex entrance passageway where the door jams, the projecting stone uh, sills that come out and frame the doorway, the, the, the outer end of those um, door jams become protected over time because people learn to build out, they, they narrow the corridor space of the passageway so that the big wooden door that's slamming against those stone door jams eventually is cushioned by the, the stonework of the wall projecting a bit further out and being flush with the door sills. So the kind of common perception amongst archaeologists is once you've learned a good feature within architectural practice, you're going to stick with it and, you, and it will last and last and last unless it starts to kind of devolve again and debase into other things and the idea gets lost. That kind of quite linear evolutionary scheme is probably pretty problematic when we think about creative communities, which are these kinds of communities I think that we're dealing with in the Iron Age. So at the Cairns, Although it's quite late Brock, as I mentioned already, probably first and second century AD is its main period of activity. It doesn't have a rebated entrance at all. The door uh, cell stones, the door jams, are completely vulnerable to that massive wooden door. In fact, so much so they probably put this large stone at the base of it to protect, so to cushion as the door closes against it, because there was no cushioning behind the door jams uh, either side. There's also no guard cells within the thickness of the wall. There's no chambers that lead off the interior passageway either at the Cairns. So while the Cairns exhibits many of the features that would be deemed to be emblematic of the true Brock, it's also much more, it's more fluid and flexible than that as well. And late on, and it may actually be a manifestation of the lateness of this Brock, it may be that they are deliberately evoking an earlier style of architecture, precisely because they know full well this is actually quite a late building. And there's, quite, there's a lot of status to be gained from pedigree and ancestry and antiquity in lots of communities. And it's almost like they're harking back to an earlier style, at this more simple style of an entrance passageway, that people coming in it would, would realise, oh, this is the early style. Oof, that's funny, isn't it? Wow, look at that. We've not seen this for a long time. You know, it's almost like they're, they're making use of that. And that's how we've got to think about architecture as it's used by people to evoke effects. It's, it's like another form of curation almost, but in a, on a mega scale. Um, depositional practice um, in architectural terms is something as well. I'm not going into huge detail. Luckily, Rick prefaced this for us by talking about these stone tools found in architectural fragments. We've got this massively spread across the Cairns. Like everywhere we excavate, we find these are stone tools incorporated within architectural portions of buildings. And it looks like they're in key areas to, to draw attention to these, these tools and draw attention to specific portions of buildings. So in the entrance passageway of one of our wags, there's a quern broken up and distributed in pieces to form the floor of the building. In the roof of our souterrain at the Cairns, there's, there are two rotary querns split and turned away from each other in terms of their working faces, um, but very evident on the roof, built into a, a strange freestanding dresser outside the Brock. We only excavated and discovered this year outside the front, thanks to Holly, the frontage of the Brock. There's a, a beautiful saddle crown placed in the foot of that dresser. And incidentally, this is the spot that was chosen to place the whalebone vessel with the remains of the elder and all that elaborate, expressive 
depositional practice that went with it. Stone tools incorporated into the corners of, of hearths. It's all that business, I would say, and they've taken things that were previously in flux, in circulation within communities that may have garnered histories and may have had values and associations and stories associated with them. They've been personal objects associated with particular people, and now they've been concretized, they've been brought in and made inalienable and permanent, set in as installations within buildings. And those buildings were visible then for hundreds of years, making these heirlooms present within the day-to-day -day lives of, of people, reminding them of the past, reminding them of stories, reminding them of who they are. So conclusions, what have we learned? Well, this is the stuff from the Brock lifestyle. So all of those features, dub, 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 all that material from the Brock, very evocative of life, lifestyle. Um, all those features down to here, formality of layout, recurrent patterns, the repetition and the recurrency of the house. If there's one thing we know about the life of humans and the world and the universe is the one certainty is not death and taxes, kind of death and taxes, but the one certain thing is change. Change will always occur. And so it's fascinating to see the schemes by which communities and cultures arrest and stabilize change. And just for a period of time, create traditions, create conditions whereby they, they can pause, they can stop, they can reflect on the world. They can feel that there's some stability. And something very humane about that, I think, comes through from the work. In the aftermath, as I mentioned, I think one of the things that's taken us to is a wider discussion of the ends of domestic architecture, circular domestic architecture in Britain, and how it's replaced by a series of other forms, which eventually are common to Europe, and which relate, I think, uh, originally to the influence of Rome um, and the Roman Empire and Roman military. The depositional aspects, well, what I'd like to point out is that it's easy for us to spot the dramatic, the odd deposits that Julian Thomas has mentioned, but it exists on a spectrum. And everything from the, the scraps of burnt bone that I talked about across the floors of the, the broch, all the way through to our more elaborate depositions of installations of items and caches of combs and human beings themselves, it all sits on a spectrum. All of that depositional practice, we have to think about it as a spectrum and not as a sort of here's ritual over here and here's all this other boring stuff. It's all endlessly fascinating and, it's, and it all can potentially tell us about, about people's understanding of the world because even when they dump a midden, there's a place for everything and everything in its place and there's ideology inherent even in the location of middens and rubbish heaps, etc., and why they're there, why they are where they are. So it's more of a spectrum than a, a binary in that sense. And I think on that note, and before my throat gives out massively so, I'll shut up with the, the usual acknowledgement of all the people that have been so massively helpful to us, the funding bodies, the people that have worked with us, and obviously the landowners at the site, Charlie and Yvonne Nicholson, and their family in the community down there at Winnick. So thank you very much. I have no idea how we went for time, but I think, well, yes, I'm being told that we have got some time. So uh, anyone like to ask any questions? Um, Martin, uh, your cycles that you just, you're describing for uh, the West, <laughs> uh, these three cycles, were they chronologically contiguous? No, they they, 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 they... Uh, yeah, sorry, David's asked the question whether there was chronological contiguity of the, the cycles within them, in the sense that they, it's clearly apparent that they've run in a sequence, very clearly, one atop the other. In fact, it's an absolute delight to excavate it. Well, it's absolutely tedious to excavate it, as Rick can attest. But it's also, it, the wonderful thing about it is the sandwiching of deposits. There's no dubiety about it. You get that nice stone floor and its own discrete hearth at the center of it. And you think, okay, well, we can we can identify this clearly as a as a floor, as a layer, as a working layer that meant something to people in the past. That's the important thing about it, is recovering 
you know, something that meant something to them rather than something that's our arbitrary unit in that sense. And when that's covered over by detritus and material that seems to emanate from the processes that were underway and that have then subsequently engulfed that floor and that hearth, and then they lay another stone flag floor on top with another hearth, that's just glorious. That just makes your heart sing because you just think, oh, yes, we're getting to understand the sequence of their occupation and their their use of that space. So yeah, it's, it, it's incredibly lucky for us to have that kind of preservation. And I mentioned that we don't necessarily see these deep sequences present in lots of other brocks. Um, so we have, so I can only assume we have got lucky there. And I, I think it's something to do with the way that that brock is internally subdivided. There's a different way in which that brock is being used. And, I, and to be honest with you, and this is moving off the point, I think that the, what I was hinting at in terms of the transformation of brocks to those wags is already underway and present within the heart of that Cairns brock because it's a late brock. It's subdivided differently. They're already doing different things within it. The, the kind of open central space and hearth and radial areas that are present in the early and middle Iron Age are changing to far more internally subdivided. There's far more distinctions being made in the architecture. And I think also between the members of the household, there's already something changing within the community, within the domestic relations. And so by the time you get to those wags, it's even more manifest in a very formalized way. Sorry, that's kind of, I, I answered my own question there on the back of the one that I hopefully answered of yours as well, David. <laughs> so, <laughs> any, other, any other questions at this stage? Find silence. So you mentioned that we need to take more books. <laughs> <laughs> How would you envisage, uh, for instance, that we can look at the landscape and try to identify places that would be best to excavate and best to be that, That's a really interesting question. Rick has asked, for the benefit of folks out in the wider network, Rick has asked, about how we can explore a wider variety of excavation settings and arenas out in the wider landscape that might give us, I presume, to give us insight into Brock period as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a funny thing because the commercial archaeology has done wonders for this across large parts of Britain in recent years, and we could almost do with more of it in the north. And I say that with tongue firmly in cheek because I don't think it's, it would be great if we were having to do so much commercial archaeology because there was such huge amounts of development of our landscapes in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland. So my tongue is in my cheek there a bit. But certainly there's no doubt that the randomization of locations within the landscape that commercial archaeology has brought to part other parts of Britain has been really beneficial because it's pushed archaeologists out of their comfortable zones of oh yeah, we'll go and have a look at this mound again, or we'll go to this honey trap site over here, or, you know, where's a good place to go from a summer holidays? I'll go and dig there. You know, it's kind of academic logic of that, of saying, right, I'm finished the teaching semester, now where can I go and dig? Oh, and there's lots of nice wine and cheese there. Yeah, that's a good, yeah, that's a good venue, I'll go there. Commercial archaeology, as it's known, has managed to randomise that in a healthy way and push the archaeologists to explore other quarters of the landscape. And lo and behold, huge amounts of different ways of looking at the past have emanated from that, um, just simply by forcing us to dig other places, many of them ugly parts of our landscape that didn't hold out the attraction that academic archaeologists uh, were looking for. So uh, uh, we need something like that that's going to force us to explore other places. There's a kind of a, there's a different kind of suppression at work in Brocks, as I alluded to, though, because Brocks are seen as they almost goes the other way with Brocks because they're so they're deemed to be so substantial, so elaborate, so monumental, so complex, and so expensive 
that the, the pendulum swings almost the other way, you know, so people are like, no, 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 no way we're going to do that. And funding bodies don't want to fund those big excavations because they know it's like a piece of string and could go on forever and ever. And we need to find some middle ground there. We need to find places in the landscape through, I think, through survey and through prospection. I think that's the key to it. And we've seen a little bit of it through the geophysics that I showed for the Cairns landscape, we need to do even more in that landscape before I feel that we can hold head, high, uh, head up high and say that we've examined that landscape thoroughly. But even the small amount of geophysical survey that we've undertaken allowed us to see there's a Neolithic settlement there. It's the only Neolithic settlement that's known in South Ronaldsea. So, I mean, that's pretty phenomenal. And we just kind of stumbled across it, basically. And once we'd done the geophysical survey, we looked at the position of it in the ground and went, oh, there's a very low mound there. So suddenly the name of the site, the Cairns, becomes more clear. It's not the Cairn, it's the Cairns, because there's multiple mounds in that landscape. So suddenly you realise that people in the past, you know, as in the local community, had it right all along in terms of their naming principles for the site. And that's what we need to do. We need to do more prospection. We need to be prepared to go to the less glamorous places. We need to do things like you know, we were talking about the fragments of human remains uh, and how we have such a fugitive trace of the funerary dead of the Iron Age period. It's f famous slash infamous for this in the large parts of the British Iron Age, including the north of Scotland. We don't find formal burial traditions. They're doing something with bodies that we don't fully understand. That means that there's almost no archaeological trace of them. When we do find intimations of whole bodies, they're very rare and they're in very specific sets of circumstances. We, we're almost, we never find them when we're looking for them. We always find them by accident. Souterrains are another case in point. There's virtually no souterrains found deliberately until recently. They're always stumbled across by accident. Uh, the, we need to be, we need to have more acuity, but we also need to change our attitudes as well. Telling myself off, we dig in another Brock mount. I mentioned the ambiguity of this at the beginning or the ambiguity of my feelings about Brock's and that, that's part of it as well. I kind of butcher and gamekeeper, guilty and judge at the same time in that sense. I'm not sure that fully answers the question. I think you could have a whole conference dedicated to that actually. Probably, but it probably bored you, so. Any more for any more? Fiona. Oh, well, in that case. Yeah, so Fiona asked the question, which was about the potential complexity, and Fiona pointed out that, that all sorts of buildings, even buildings that we have in our own day-to-day -day lives and experiences, have all sorts of cross-cutting activities, but often gendered activities related to them as well, and community halls with spaces and rooms in them that sometimes are taken up by one or other gender, but then at other times it might change. So there's ver versatility is a good word. And that's one of the age-old questions. And one of the things archaeologically that we find often difficult to come to terms with, are we looking at spaces that are firmly established, routinely, permanently, and full-time for certain you know, uses, purposes, and, and identities present there, types of people present there, or is there more flexibility? You know, a, a, a loom can be dragged out and set up for a few hours and then taken away again. You know, it, it's that kind of thing. And we know that, for instance, in the better documented ancient Greek households, we know that there were, there were firm areas of the household that were set aside for men and women, notionally, 
but there was also flexibility and a bit of versatility as well, as you say, so that things could be brought in at particular times of the year and taken out. And it's that kind of, that trying to understand that from the archaeological record is, is quite deeply fascinating, but also really difficult, really, really challenging. Um, and I, I would certainly imagine that there is a bit of flexibility in that space. And not only, you know, in a cycle of, days, weeks, months, years, et cetera, but probably through time, things probably change. In fact, we know that things change quite dramatically within that broch through time with hearths, change locations altogether. Yeah. Rooms that didn't have hearths suddenly become, have a hearth in a late stage and vice versa. So there's there's changes that work within it later on as well. One of the things I would say is that that, um, that binary space that I evoked in terms of the two major sweeps of rooms within it. The interesting thing is that in the West Room that I'd spent more time talking about, there is a hearth that was there that obviously was repeated through time. And in the other suite, the South and Southeast suite, there's also a very big hearth in there. And again, I think that the presence of these two hearths in each of those rooms indicates that there is, there is really quite strong divisioning of the categories of people that make up that household, even down to the point where they are preparing and consuming food in quite a distinctively different um, space. So I think that uh, who knows if it is gender and we might get more, when we get more data on that, we may have some up our sleeves already that I can't divulge yet in terms of um, dietary isotopes, DNA, uh, the set, the biological sex of individuals from that household. So, I th yeah, we might we might get closer to this in a definitive sense, but it's a challenge for sure. Okay. Oh, George. Please. You were talking earlier on following on uh, the use of spaces, but earlier on you were talking about rocks as houses, mm -hmm. which kind of implies households mm -hmm. and like you would have a household in the big house and other people in the smaller houses and you've already got chieftains followers <laughs> almost lords and peasants but is it a case i mean is that the case that there is a separation of the people using those spaces the sense that different spaces are used for different purposes Smaller places for sleeping, looking in those bags. Is this a question of households and houses or it means domestically mm -hmm. by the community? George has asked the question about a, a kind of flexibility of the use of space, but in a slightly different way, in terms of how that operates across differential social status and about people occupying, say, the broch versus other buildings within the village settlement context there and whether or not that equates to quite strong strict divisions of people where they belong in their house with their household or whether there's more movement through i think there would have been a bit of both i do think that these houses generally would have betokened a place that people belong to but i think one of the interesting things it's a shame i never brought it out but there's enough time spent on what i did talk about but one of the things that's really, really interesting is the ways in which the Brocks in Shetland and their village settlements are architecturally really quite pronouncedly different from the village settlements that are found around the Brocks of Orkney and Caithness. And in Orkney and Caithness, the, the village settlement buildings share walls. So if you go to Brock of Gurness, you see these kind of irregular shaped buildings that are part of a ring of settlement that surrounds the the nucleated focal point in the broch, and the walls, the very much are semi-detached properties. The walls all lean on each other and they form a kind of a, a network, a honeycomb of buildings. And there are often doorways between these buildings as well as into pathways that lead into the, the open spaces of the village and up to the broch. In Shetland, it's very different. Independent households are maintained, I would argue, through independent architecture of so-called wheelhouses or aisle drowned houses, where they are, although they, some of them lean on each other a little bit here and there, but generally they're architecturally distinctive and discreet from each other. They form a ring around the broch in a similar fashion. So superficially, they look quite similar, 
but there's something different. And I think it's instructive when you see the difference between those, as often as not, when you see a contrast, it makes you realise uh, this is what the Orkney and Caithness ones are all about, because the Shetland ones are different. And when you see the ones in Shetland, it's almost as if any of those households could claim to be the predominant household next week or next year or in 10 years' time. It's as if they're maintaining their independence, they're maintaining their, their own authority. Yes, they're they're currently part of that wider community of the Broch at, say, Yarlsoff or Old Scatnance. But at any point, that household there could be poised to take over in some kind of din dynastic rumbling. In Orkney and Caithness, no chance. You can see that the, the village is completely organised on the Broch. They've entirely given up their sense of independence. And the, the major social referent, the major political and moral reference point for them is the broch that sits in the middle of their community. And their own houses are linked into each other. There are doorways between those houses sometimes, as I say. So there is toing and froing between those buildings. I think there's more of a shared sense of community, but there's also a, probably a steeper social pyramid. There's higher social distinction, I think, in Orkney and Caithness than there is in Shetland. I think in Shetland there's a flatter social pyramid and in Orkney there's a steeper social pyramid. And that might be why some interpreters, some archaeologists have even gone so far as to suggest that as you move into the first, second, third centuries AD and beyond, Orkney even suggests Orkney had hegemony over the Western Isles at one point in that later prehistoric period. I'm not sure I would go with that, but certainly that's an indication of how well organised the Orkney and Caithness Iron Age looks in terms of they have eradicated any dissonance within their community. The Broch sits at the hub of it and that's it. Having said all of that, it still could be the case that the Broch is operating as a community hub, not as a elite residence at all, but as just the, the place where they store their grain, the place where they come in and feast. So that's one of the, the one of the things that we want to peer into at the Cairns, one of our major research aims is to get to the bottom of that once and for all, at least for that site, is to establish what was the relationship between the villagers and the Broch household if it was a, 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 a fully-fledged permanent household entity in that sense. And one of the ways that we have of answering that, we hope, is to peer into the middens that pertain to the Broch. I've already mentioned there's a very distinctively different food culture at work within that Broch compared to the rest of the settlement. That could that could still be read off. That could be read off as high status, but it could just be read off. You know, it could be that the, the occupants of the Brock are eating all the great food of the day, the red deer, all the rest of it in larger quantities. Or it could be that the village community comes into the Brock and feasts it up of an evening. What we'd hope to see is a difference in the pace and tempo of that middening of that material. You would you would expect. If it's the day-to-day -day activities of an elite residence, an elite household, you'd expect to see them churning that material out constantly on a day-to-day basis. Whereas if if it's the village coming in and having a feast and whipping it up at harvest time or whatever, you'd expect to see it more punctuated in the middens. So that's why it's hugely important for us to peer into the food refuse of those communities and to compare the broch diet to the diet of the other buildings. Food is one way into exploring those issues of differential status and identity. But then even within the Brock, because I've, I've evoked that idea of all the red deer and red meat and all the rest of it, that's just a West Room thing. The South and Southeast Room is full of whalebone shell and seafood, um, which again might pertain to the dietary isotopes that I was alluding to and the high marine input of our, our great old lady, the elder. Uh, the old the old woman who whose remains were used to 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 signify the end of the broch. So again, there might be gendering in that. Right. Should I shut up? I should say so. <laughs> <laughs>